Hi everybody, welcome to the latest Ardmore Masterclass uh, video and today I'm joined by Paul James, uh, Account Strategy Director here at Ardmore and today I'm joined by Luke Hanley who is our Senior Copywriter here at Ardmore um, and has been here copywriting and sprinkling all sorts of magic dust on advertisements uh, and uh, various other uh, marketing collateral for the past two years. So today Luke has got a really interesting presentation uh, that he shared recently with the with the team here in Ardmore um, around applying behavioural science and the EAST framework. So this is a, a fascinating piece of work um, researched from, from the works of Richard Shotton um, and this is this is kind of all really uh, close close to my heart, uh, close to my work, and close to um, basically everything that we would do here in the agency. So I'm not going to hold up look any further ado. Um, let's just let's just get into the presentation, and get sure this with everybody. Look, so if you wouldn't mind just kicking off with a with a brief little introduction to yourself and um, yeah. where you've come from on this presentation, and then. Then let it go for us. No problem. That was a glowing introduction. Um, so yeah, as you said, I've been writing copy here for for two years, um, and uh, I've been, you know, I've, I've been working on basically every every client and every account that we have. And what, what's really lovely about this uh, sort of framework of of approaching campaigns and approaching both creative work and strategy is that there isn't a single client or campaign that this wouldn't relate to, um, and equally there isn't a single department. Within, within an agency and you know for, for clients themselves who this wouldn't relate to. So, um, I mean, the work Richard Shotton's done, this is very much a, a brief overview uh, based on a, a webinar that um, a group called Pro Copywriters held uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Richard's book, which I'll, I'll mention at the end, The Choice Factory, um, is, is just a really illuminating uh, bit of work and you know just completely changes ways of, of thinking conceptually and creatively and it's uh so that this is a distillation of some of the the ideas from that so um start to kick things off the ebbing house illusion so this is something that um a lot of people will be familiar with um it's a diagram that dates back to the 1890s and it's essentially a a look at how our brain perceives things based on um that which is around it so if you take this diagram the brain tells you that the image on the left uh, has a smaller blue dot than the image on the right, but the fact is, and no one will be shocked to hear, both blue dots are the same size. But the way your brain relates this information is to do with proximity, um, to do with relativity, essentially. Um, and what Shotton's done is basically taken this principle, which as I said, you know, is from the 1890s, but you know, still perplexes the brain today. Uh, what he has done is started to look at this in terms of value in particular. So rather than letting a product or a service define itself based on its own value, the brain perceives its worth based on that which surrounds it. So to kick this off, um, one of the things that Shotton looked at was when Nespresso launched. So when Nespresso were launching a new coffee, they wanted a way to find a, a niche in the market and this was the competition, you know, bags of coffee that you'd pay five or six quid for, you get 500 grams of coffee, great, beans, grind, whatever it was, this is what you would get. But when Nespresso launched, they came out with this, which was the pod. Now, gram for gram, if you were to take the coffee from one of these pods and put it into a 500 gram bag, it would cost about 50 pounds. But people still seem to want to buy it. Uh, and sales were spectacular and the thing that was particularly fascinating was people's perception of the value of these pods because even though they were significantly more expensive than a bag of coffee the brain didn't think about them like that you were no longer in the same competitive market as a bag of coffee suddenly the pod was situated like this which was you know the equivalent of one pod which is let's say 50p worth of coffee compared to a Starbucks or a Costa at, you know, 350, suddenly you've got a bargain. But your brain's already in that scenario of thinking, this is value compared to what I would get for a similar level of product. So looking at this, and the second uh, example here was the uh, M&S Dine-In for Two. 
So m and took some of these principles of comparison and brought them into essentially something that most supermarkets would offer. Um, but where m and situated things differently was they took you out of the supermarket entirely. So the dine for two strategy works on this principle of, first of all, it's no longer a meal deal. A meal deal is what you get in Tesco's for lunch. Uh, when you dine in, you immediately are equating things with restaurants or with a takeaway. You're thinking dinner that I'm gonna spend with people, time with people and time and effort to make this look nice. There's a certain level of quality that you immediately get when you talk about dining. But then if we were to take this and actually deconstruct it, what we have is the headline dictates the competition. It immediately takes you away from, well, I could go to a different supermarket and get this. On the top right, you have a menu, which is, you know, rather than what's included in your deal, it is positioned as, you know, the choice that you would get in a restaurant. And then just to absolutely reassure the customer in the bottom right there, you have exclusivity. And this is something I'm gonna come on to later about choice elimination. And the idea that this ad gives people choice. You choose your main meal, you choose your side dish, you choose your dessert, you choose your wine, you get it all for 10 pounds. But the basic decision of, I am getting something from this selection has already been made. And that is something people find a lot easier to work with. So with calling out the competition, where this sits is, you know, a brand can choose to market itself within its own sphere or it can completely come out of left field. And this is what happened very recently with little, uh, no one's quite sure what to call it, but a social meltdown essentially where Justin Bieber decided to challenge 58 year old Tom Cruise to a fight. Now, before this happened, if you were to say Justin Bieber is going to have a fight, who's it going to be against? And if someone had said Justin Bieber is going to fight Zac Efron, I'd have gone fine. Yeah, this is great. But for some reason, Bieber decided to completely change the competition and it completely changed the way that people looked at Justin Bieber. There was a slight level, of course, with people looking at him to go, is this guy unhinged? But also suddenly, you know, who is tougher? This young athletic singer or a 58 year old tried and tested action movie star? And it just completely changed everyone's perception of Bieber as a brand. It was, you know, a genius move if it was a marketing ploy. Um, but to take that into a, a different real world example is to completely throw yourself out of your, your own sphere. This was something that Trojan Condoms did for a while, which was rather than market themselves amongst other brands selling the same thing was, well, your choice really is you can either buy this or you can start buying nappies for a child for the next few years. And it's the difference between spending $3.25 for a one-off experience to $22 every time you need a top up of nappies. And immediately you go, right, well, this is a no brainer. I'll, I'll, I'll buy the Trojan product, but you don't think I'll go to the next shelf and see what other brands are available. Imagine already the decision has been made. The choice elimination is it's product A or product B. It doesn't matter that they aren't the same. So this is essentially where the Ebbinghaus illusion comes into play in a very real world way. And what Shotton looks at um, off the back of this is something called the EAST framework. And the EAST framework, essentially it's an acronym that looks at four approaches to creative thinking and delivering creative work. So I'm just gonna dive right in. These are the four sections of the EAST framework. To make a campaign easy, attractive, social, and timely. So uh, one by one, I'm just gonna go through these and explain uh, exactly what those mean and kick things right off from the top. Make it easy. There we have Jack Grealish and Dean Smith there with the easy accomplishment that was Aston Villa making their way back into the Premier League. I should point out Richard Shotton is not, as far as I'm aware, a Villa fan. So any Villa references are absolutely mine and I'm proud of them. Um, so the first thing I'm making it easy is this is all to do with the user experience. This is all to do with the audience's own ease of use of your product or service. So in 2017, I should point out this was in a pre-GDPR world. But in 2017, there was considerable research that was done into uh, user response rates for sign-up forms. And the first form that was offered to users was a very simple, we will send you this link, click it, fill in your details, hit submit, and you will be signed up to this service. And when that sort of, you know, everyone's seen it, that sort of link was sent, the results showed that 1% of users 
would uh, would fill in the form and complete the system. It's fine, but we wanted to find something easier. So the researchers looked at a second model, which was a simplified text back. So uh, if you would like more information on this, text back the word yes and uh, followed by your details, we'll sign you up. So, you know, pretty dramatic increase from 1% to 8% if you were to look at that in real world audience figures. But still, there's obviously a massive margin for improvement. So the model that was then adopted that showed a staggering result was the unsubscription. So the idea that you were auto-enrolled into a campaign, your information was already there and it was a simple request of, if you don't want to be part of this, just hit unsubscribe, job done. And where this showed really, really promising results was with pension scheme signups. So now uh, staff at companies are auto-enrolled into a number of pension schemes and the, the figures of, of people who are now in working jobs who have you know, set up pension plans is, is staggering compared to what it used to be. So what this all comes down to is what I sort of alluded to earlier, which is called choice paralysis. And it's a point by which audiences want to feel in control. They want a level of choice. But there is a peak that you can see on this graph that by the time a certain amount of choice becomes available, things become overwhelming and happiness then starts to decrease. You don't want to give your audience the challenge. This is what making it easy is, is to go, here is the choice that you you deserve and here is the variety that we should have available, but it's nothing beyond that. There's nothing overly complicated. So to go back to the M&S example, it was just choose your four sections of your deal and that's it. So the audience is not at any stage overwhelmed with what it is that they're trying to get. And where this you know, sits in, in very obvious terms is if I was to say that these six mugs are all the same and ask anyone to pick one, user bias will start to come in. So I might say, I'll take the red mug. Why? I like the color red. That is it. There's no other reason. But if you can find a way to position your product or service with a more unique offering and amongst competitors that aren't considerable, so take the Trojan condoms example, is surrounded by shelves and shelves of nappies, suddenly the choice is much easier. So regardless of what's behind each of these seven doors, everyone is in some respect attracted to choosing the yellow one. It makes the decision easier. So this is the next section that uh, this leads on to, which is what uh, researchers find was that if you were to ask someone to put up a giant sign, uh, this was the best example I could find, but the put up a giant sign in your front yard, generally people will say no. No one wants to advertise something for free. If you were to go back to those people and say, would you put up a small sticker, bumper sticker or a small sticker in the window, a number of people will say yes. The interesting statistic here is that if you then go back to the group who said yes with the same sign, the same giant sign that you had in the initial questionnaire, 75% of those people who've already said yes will allow you to put up the sign. And Regardless of the messaging, the reason behind this is people want to be consistent and moreover, they want to appear to be consistent with their behavior. They want to have what Shotton refers to as pro-social behavior. And this is you know behavior for the greater good, but also behavior that people find appealing. And uh, consistency is a very appealing thing. So this leads us on quite nicely to the second section of uh, the campaign, this is to, uh, of the East framework, which is to make it attractive. So you have our delightful staff here at Ardmore uh, making things attractive. And this is an approach that uh, Shotton recommends. He said, the word risk is in itself a risk. It is something clients never want to hear because risks are inherently dangerous. But if you reposition things as being distinctive, suddenly everything changes. There's a 30% greater likelihood of memorability if your campaign is distinctive. So the question now is, how do you make your campaign distinctive? And uh, Shotton talks in detail about uh, something called the pratfall effect. Now this sort of dates back to people uh, enjoying slapstick comedy, you know, is that everyone is programmed to distrust. We live in a, a society built on, you know, being guilty until proven innocent rather the other way around and um there are numerous ways that you can 
you can deal with this. Um, one is to, to pretend the issue isn't there. Another is to you know cover up the issue in whichever, whichever which way you seem high or to distract the audience with something else. But one of the things that has shown really positive results is to introduce a flaw. And you know, really famous example of this that sort of changed advertising in the 60s was Volkswagen pointing out that not all of their products were perfect. And this is something that has been done you know, countless times since. Um, and you know, the other example image there of, of the Pratt Fall in a, in a real world scenario is when Jennifer Lawrence won uh, her Oscar was that she fell going up the stairs to receive the award. And what happened in this moment was uh, two things. One, as Jennifer Lawrence reached the height of her career, she had a moment that completely humanized her again. She had reached absolute stardom in, you know, in acting circles, certainly movie acting circles, she had reached the absolute pinnacle. And she proved that she was no different than everyone watching at home. And it made the world even more endeared. And the other thing was that you could see in the front row of the audience how everyone reacted. And the first person to jump up, no one would be surprised to hear, was Hugh Jackman to offer a hand. And it just reiterated that Hugh Jackman is the down-to-earth normal nice guy. And in this world of Hollywood, you know, fake plastic, uh, you know, surrealism, essentially, uh, that it didn't matter the cameras were on, didn't matter anything. He just was the good person who went over and offered a hand. And I think this is the point that Volkswagen made. And this is the point that so many brands make was that there are real people building these machines. There are real people running these companies and there are going to be imperfections, but that is what will open you to a brand. So where this leads to is social impact. And uh, we're talking here not about social media, but about you know social in the traditional sense. And the image that I've chosen there, just for this breaker slide of, of Everyone Loves Raymond is a really very simple example of this in practice in that before anyone has watched this show, you are predisposed to believe that you're going to love it because quite simply put, everyone loves Raymond and Raymond is the lead character. That is the nature of titling a show like this. Um, of course, anyone who's watched the show knows that isn't quite true, but it is a very basic social principle of how creating a popular behavior works. So this is in short, the basic principle of influence um, that to show that a behavior is popular or commonplace to increase its popularity. So looking at this, you know, again, in, in real world practice was something that has become increasingly prevalent over the last few years. Certainly I've noticed is um, signs in hotel bathrooms about reusing tiles. So one of the things that um, hotel operators find was if they put up a sign that said, um, help the environment, choose to reuse your tile, they find there was a 35% uh, share in their guests who would follow up and, and reuse their own tiles. But, you know, again, behavioral analysis coming into play, they wanted to find a way to make this, you know, a more widely accepted behavior. So they changed the messaging. And uh, the operator said, most of our guests choose to reuse their tiles. So suddenly you've gone from a very, you know, unquantifiable broad statement about helping the environment in a, in a small way to, oh, suddenly people who are in this space and who share my demographic are doing this. And they found a spike of an additional 9% of users uh, were reusing their tiles. But again, they wanted to push things further. And this was when they saw the biggest uh, spike was when they were to say guests who have stayed in this very room choose to reuse their tiles so suddenly it was you know beyond a basic demographic it was you know it wasn't the guy staying three floors above in the penthouse it was you know someone who is the equivalent of you who can afford the same level of hotel room is doing this therefore this is a behavior you should adopt and they find that 49 percent of people followed so to near, essentially half of the guests in the hotel responded positively to this message. Now, where it becomes very interesting and where we talk about pro-social behavior again is that if you were to offer users those three statements to say, you can reuse your tile because it's good for the environment, because guests in this hotel do it, or because guests in this room in this hotel do it, the vast majority, if not all people in that survey will say that the messaging that will react or resonate the best with them is, of course, the environmental one. And again, this is because people don't only want to be 
consistent with their behavior, but they want to be seen to be adopting a pro-social behavior. So of course they want to say, oh yes, the environmental message is the most important one. So what this you know, illuminates for me, if, you know, coming from a copywriting standpoint, is the power in rationalizing a message based not only on what people say they want to hear, but what the research shows they want to hear. And more importantly, the ability to test your messaging. You know, this is one of the things that certain social platforms are very good for, is uh, allowing you to put out multiple copywriting options and seeing which performs the best. Uh, you know, email marketing does a very similar thing. And you get to see which message is actually you know, having the greatest result. So another great example of making something social was when Apple launched the iPod and uh, to what has now become an iconic uh, ad campaign image from 2001. So when Apple launched the iPod, they were by far not the first MP3 market, uh, MP3 player on the market. They were, you know, entering a very, you know, set up world where people still had their, uh, you know, portable CD players and, you know, MP3 players were coming along, but they, they, you know, there was nothing unique about iPod other than it was made by Apple. But there were two approaches that they took to making this a social behavior. So one was they looked at the fact that the iPod itself is never seen. An MP3 player is not a product that people have out on show. It's in your pocket. And this was their headline, 10,000 songs in your pocket. Now, that's great on a headline on a billboard like this where someone is dancing with uh, you know their music playing, but what happens in the real world when you can't see that product? You can't see the 10,000 songs themselves. You can't see that in someone's pocket. But what you could see with the iPod was the white headphones. And they became synonymous with iPod use. And that itself became the, the social behavior. That became the norm. And it became this fact that if you saw someone sitting on the bus with their headphones in and those headphones were white, it was beyond assumption. You knew that in their pocket sat an iPod and therefore in their pocket sat 10,000 songs. And that is what created a social norm, which then created the massive sales boost, which has led to Apple being the massive company they, they now are. And this was all about doing something at a time that was key. And that leads nicely into the last section of the East framework, which is to make it timely. Um, now, making it timely isn't so much about uh, time in relation to an era or you know societal times, but individual times. Again, this is all about the audience and the user. So uh, one thing that uh, has, has come out is there's a lot of research about what uh, Shotton refers to, a nice, a nice term for them is nine enders. And these are people whose uh, ages currently end in nine. Uh, so anyone who's essentially about to hit a milestone birthday. And as, as the line there says on the presentation, you know, people are more likely to adopt a new behavior at a key milestone. So um, the, the figures that, uh, that Shotton put forward, you know, that were really interesting were 48% of all first time marathoners have their age ending in nine. So, you know, essentially half of the people doing a marathon for the first time have an age ending in nine. Uh, similar, you know, we looked at um, signups to the the affair website, Ashley Madison, again, has a, has a strong proportion of nine enders. And equally, um, suicide rates are quite a high one in this. Um, there is a, a considerable, not, not to the extent of the, the other figures, but there is certainly a considerable amount of nine enders who are, um, committing suicide at that, at that stage in their lives. So in terms of making it timely, this is key is to look at your audience beyond you. Know, if you look at demographic, it's always, you know, females aged 25 to 35. But if you were to look further within that niche to go, oh, actually we're gonna look specifically at 29 year olds, the response rate that you see could be significantly higher, for example. So uh, another section on making it timely is what we refer to as the peak end rule. So if you were to take any experience uh, or you know, viewing of any art form, people are most likely to remember the point of peak emotion, whether it be positive or negative, the most cathartic experience within that, that moment is going to be the most memorable. And then similarly, they will remember the end. So it's why you can watch a terrible movie, which has a great ending and think it was a masterpiece. And equally, you will be most likely to remember 
the point of maximum emotion. So uh, I did a little social experiment around the office where I just called out and said, everyone think of the film Titanic and think of a moment in that film. And there were only two moments that everyone went to. No one talked about the iceberg. Uh, no one talked about the start of the film. The two moments were the moment where Kate and Leo are uh, at the front of the ship and uh, Kate says, I'm flying. And the other moment was the raunchy, steamy scene in the back of the car where Kate Winslet's hand goes up against the steamy window and rubs a big handprint down it. There are two peak emotional moments. And in this case, the, that emotion is, is love. Um, but if you were to take the same thing of, of a sad film, it would be the moment of, of maximum impact where you, you cry. Um, and then, as I say, the, the second point of this is, is the end. So there are ways of putting this thinking into practice. And one of the, the places that has done this beautifully is the Magic Castle Hotel. Now, this is, by all accounts, a not overly appealing looking hotel uh, in Los Angeles. And somehow they have become one of the highest rated hotels consistently on TripAdvisor. Um, so what I want to look at now is how they have done that. And they have put the peak end rule into practice. And how they've done this is with a little device called the Popsicle Hotline. Now, the Popsicle Hotline is a 24-hour service that the Magic Castle Hotel offers, where you're sitting by the pool, you jump up, run over and lift up this red phone, which is essentially a bat phone, that links you directly through to the staff where you can order the popsicle of your choosing. They will bring it down, no cost, there's no limits, no fuss. It is there, simple. And 94% of the reviews on TripAdvisor for the Magic Castle Hotel rate it as very good or excellent. And uh, you know that is a staggering amount for a hotel that, as I say, is not visually overly appealing. And, TripAdvisor is a site that works very heavily on imagery. You know, it's, it's the first point of reference anyone's going to have to their trip. But of those 94% of reviews, half of them directly mention the Popsicle hotline. So one of the ways that this is done is this is the peak moment of enjoyment. It is a, un a unique offering of this hotel. It's not an expensive one to operate it, but it is a unique offering that as you leave, guests are reminded of. When you check out, the staff will say, did you make use of the Popsicle hotline? So at the end of the process, the staff remind you of your peak moment of enjoyment during your stay. So that rounds things off quite nicely to the peak end rule being the end of this presentation. But uh, just to sum up, the EAST framework is based on four principles to make it easy, attractive, social, and timely. And all of these, the most important takeaway is that all of these relate directly to your audience, making it easy for them, making it attractive to them, making it social for those around them, and making it timely in direct relation to them themselves. And this was the last thing that Shotton said in his presentation. He said that all this thinking comes together and when you start thinking this way, you start to narrow your thinking, but in a you know, perfectly funneled way where you have distilled all the right information and the right approaches. And he said, give me the freedom of a tight brief. And it just, it was a line that really, really resonated with me. And I think whenever I delivered this presentation to the rest of the team here at Ardmore, you know, it resonated with them as well. It was a really beautiful way of thinking. And uh, as I said earlier, Shotton's book, The Choice Factory, will, uh, it, you know, this, this is a very, very quick overview of some of the thinking in it, but there is some great work. And I, I know I'm not the only one in the agency who's read this and, and find it really illuminating. So I would highly, highly recommend it. Thank, thanks, Luke. Wow, well, I mean, there's just... I don't even really know where to begin to kind of unpick all that, yeah. uh, or unpack it. Sorry, the there's just so much, um, so much value in there. And we could probably take each um, concept, if you like, each behavioural concept, um, and and dissect it and go through probably up team pieces of evidence and up team ways of applying it. But I suppose that the magic in it, in it all is is trying to figure out which bits to apply at, at, at you know at certain times you can't necessarily apply it all to to everything but it's trying to look and see which of these behavioral levers you can pull um in your in your campaigns or in your marketing or whatever 
the, the two two I mean there's so much in it uh, like I have reams and reams of notes here and uh, you know in the interest of time I'm not going to unpack everything but we might we might come back and do maybe a couple more of these and just try to unpick a few of these things but a couple a couple of really important things that I just wanted to touch upon um first is the the, the quote at the end give me the freedom of a tight brief fantastic quote um really really close to to the hearts of any uh hearts and minds of any market and agency um in terms of what we hope for what we look for what we we encourage uh clients to give to us um but the brief is just so vitally important for us in order to um create a clear path of thinking around a creative idea um and it's certainly something that we are um we're going to be looking at in terms of another up and coming um masterclass video around the you know what's involved in that perfect brief or what are the key elements of that or what should should clients be looking out for that and the second thing that i just wanted to touch upon um having um having done quite a bit of work recently and I just want to ask you about your thoughts on this look um I've done quite a bit of work recently on um advertising effectiveness and um the principle that advertising should be emotionally led um in order to be at its most effective and this peak end rule really strikes a chord with me because I've read quite a bit about this in terms of what you're looking for there in a in a campaign or a piece of creative is to create as intense an emotional reaction as possible whether that as you say whether that's positive or negative um and in the past I've I've seen this uh, quoted um as what's known as a somatic marker which is um, so the somatic marker in the Titanic movie is is the is the two stars at the front of the at the front of the ship. A somatic marker is a bit like burning a CD in your brain, um, and it takes a really intense emotion to to burn that memory in there. But then once it is done, all sorts of things can help you recall that memory, which is ultimately what marketing is all about. So, for example, a piece of music can help you recall it. Um, the brand name could help you recall it. Seeing a piece of outdoor advertising could help you recall a full TV ad. Um, and I just wanted your your thoughts on, uh, you know how you know how important is emotion in these things? How important is it to get to an intense peak rather than a build? Um, or do you or or what's your what's your feelings on all that? Well, I mean, yeah, it's. It's a broad question in a you know especially an agency like ours where you work on so many platforms. Um, you know one of my favorite platforms to write for is radio, um, because usually your time limit is short, and you're uh, you're limited to to sound. So you know creating an emotional connection through radio can be can be difficult. Um, and you know you're surrounded by other messages. You're trying to squeeze in key hit points, but that that goal of of as you say you know creating that marker is is huge and i think it was um one of the things that i researched quite a lot when i first started here was um how affect works in ads and um there's a, a really great piece of work by brinkema about this and uh the example that i gave actually in a, in a blog that i did not long ago was uh in return of the jedi and spoiler warnings for anyone here but um when luke skywalker at the end of return of the jedi takes off darth vader's helmet and sees uh, Anakin Skywalker for, for the first time in, in the flesh. Uh, very famously, Mark Hamill couldn't cry. So there's a really interesting sequence of cuts that uh, show Luke Skywalker looking at uh, Anakin, Anakin looking back, and then back onto Luke Skywalker, and suddenly he has a big glob of Vaseline on his cheek <laughs> to, to represent the tear. And the, the reason that this was added was uh, Richard Marquand who directed it and obviously George Lucas who's the, the godfather of that brand you know, um, they felt audiences wouldn't understand the emotional depth without seeing the tear without seeing Skywalker cry and you know this if, if, if you look at that and those those markers of affect and, and the things that are triggering the emotion a 
across advertising films any other platform even with songs you know certain like uh, Mozart used certain keys to trigger emotions he had his tragic key which was G minor he had his demonic key which was D minor and when you start to implement those sort of you know base responses to people you that that achieves maximum impact and I think one of the things that you know will will come into everyone's thinking in the next few months is as you know we delve into that territory is with Christmas advertising you know it's always a time of year when people are used to now the the John Lewis ads and you know how much am I going to cry at this year's ad and um I think there's big there has been this big connection between brand recall especially at Christmas time and affect and in, in terms of uh, social media shareability and making that as again like a pro-social behavior it's you know that the question of oh have you seen the new john lewis ad and you know that becomes in itself a norm and it, it makes the brand synonymous with christmas essentially and i think you know it, it's a great example of how those markers come to play and how they they use you know more often than not cover versions of songs you know so um you know there was a the year that tom o'dell covered uh, john lennon and there was a the year that elbow covered the Beatles and um, you know uh, there was a year Ellie Golding covered Your Song by Elton John and, and they're using these these points of nostalgia essentially to elicit that emotional response and that emotional response absolutely stays memorable you know absolutely creates that marker so I think it's it's a huge huge element of of what we do uh, and, and again as I say positively or negatively if that's you know biting into a subway sandwich and having a smile on your face or it's you know something as as big as as a john lewis ad you know there's there's always a a, a need for that you know sort of cathartic experience cool and, and and just one last question look before we before we wrap up on on emotion how because you're a bit of a storyteller yeah um so how important is the story or the narrative um, in in let's say um, controlling or adjusting someone's state and, and really sort of driving that intense emotional uh, reaction through yeah I mean I think there's there's a few copywriters particularly that I've spoken to about this a few creatives in general and one of the sort of underlying agreements that we all have is that story is really driven by character um, and I think that's what brings that relatability to any any piece of work but in terms of having, you know, um, when you boil down any character, there's a, a quote from one of the Spider-Man films where uh, someone says that there is only one question in all of narrative, and that is, who am I? Uh, and I think if you look at that, if you can answer that question in terms of the audience by the time they have watched whatever it is that you're serving them, and again, the character in it, the thing that it, your character isn't necessarily a person, um, but if you can boil down that sort of understanding on an emotional level and answer that question, then the story will write itself to a degree and you will have, you know, a really solid level of empathy there. And I think that is, I mean, it's, it's such a huge, huge, huge part of, of our industry. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't think the industry would be what it is without that. Okay. Thanks, Luke. Thanks. So, so, um, Yes, we we may, as I say, may, we may come back and uh, maybe unpick, uh, and unpack one or two of those uh, concepts in in more depth. But fascinating presentation, um, really fascinating to talk to you. Um, and all I would say now to everybody who's watching, I hope you got some value out of that. Uh, please, if you did, do do share it around. Um, and if you need any help with your next campaign or an implying any of the the science that uh, Lucas talked about today please do reach out and and contact me at paul.james at ardmore.co.uk and we'd be we'd be delighted to have a chat with you so thanks Luke thanks everybody until next time all the best <laughs>